We're back for another exciting episode of The Spicy Life. I am your relationship expert and magnetic matchmaker, Spicy Mari. And on today's amazing episode, we're covering the three ways a man views a woman. So get ready because to join me in the G spot, that is the guest spotlight. Don't get a little scared over here. We have the humorous, the phenomenal Ron G. He is an hey. Emmy award-winning producer, actor, and comic, and host of Couples Couch. So saw an amazing episode that Ron G had done with his wife, Manal. Am I saying it right? Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, um, she has a beautiful name, by the way, and you guys are a beautiful couple, but I saw mm-hmm. an incredible uh, spot that you guys had done on your IG mm-hmm. regard to the three ways a man views a woman and mm-hmm. um, you categorize them. So we're going to dive deep into that because I'm really curious in like unpacking what you mentioned. Um, but first, in order to warm you up, Boo, you have to tell us when you first fell in love with yourself. This is how we get a little bit intimate and you share with the world when you first fell in love with yourself. It's actually a great question. Uh, I think I probably fell in love with myself after I found my purpose. Probably like year two of doing comedy because I was good at a lot of stuff, but I wasn't great at anything. Mm. And I felt like when God like put it on my heart, like, I need you to do this thing. Uh, this is going to be your thing. Yeah. But I won't give you all the details. I'll spoon feed it to you because if I told you everything you had to go through to become who I need you to become, you'll probably get scared and run. So I'm going to spoon feed this thing to you. And <laughs> once I realized the impact I had of just doing comedy... And like being able to create my own life from my thoughts. Mm. Um, and like when you find your purpose, like I found my wife because I, I said yes to my dream. I found my purpose and I'm having this conversation because I said yes to my purpose. You know what I'm yes. saying? Like I, was a, I used to be an accountant. So if I was an accountant, I wouldn't be having this conversation with you. So um, very grateful that I did say yes and I didn't run from what God put on my heart. And um, that was the beginning of me falling in love with myself. Wow. Okay. So... <laughs> This is not what today's episode is about. However, um, my practice is very purpose driven and helping people find their purpose mates, right? So, like, yep. I have to address this really quick. Okay. You, what you identified what your purpose was and your calling, and because you were mm-hmm. walking in your purpose, you're saying that that also helped you meet your wife. Like that also helped you call her in and channel her. Absolutely, okay. absolutely. Um, I think before I got married, I think as a man you shouldn't get married until after you find your purpose. I feel like that's the fair thing to do. Cause like, mm. ain't nothing worse than a man have a whole family. And then one day he like, Hey babe, he 40 years old. Like, hey, I want to start an R and B group. You're like, man, don't do, that <laughs> your family. don't do that. You got this pension. You got this health insurance. You got this life. Don't do that to your family. You know what I'm saying? But once you find your purpose, it makes it easier because I feel like a, a lot of my mistakes in my earlier dating was I was dating for where I was, but not for where I was going. And I mm. dated a lot of girls who could handle where I was and they love the the things that come along with what I do, but yep. they couldn't handle where I was going. And when mm. I met my wife, I met her at a comedy club. So there's no conversation about what are you going to do for a living? Like, how are you going to provide? You know what I'm saying? Right. She saw me providing when she met me. And then I realized I could take her to work with me, too, because I couldn't. I've dated people who could, I couldn't take to my job because it was just a headache of them monitoring, who hugging me, talking to me. I'm like, I can't do that. My wife's mm-hmm. like, look, you need to go ahead and cut your hair and put some cologne on be cute so we can get this money. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And I was like, wait, you... That's okay. It's okay to be my best self while I'm out in the streets. Yeah. But like my wife, she's awesome, man. I'm glad I met her. And it sounds like too, for those who are listening, like y'all pay attention. What Ranji is saying is his wife knew what she was signing up for. And she was in alignment with this plan, this game plan that he had and what he was doing. Right. A lot of women come into the situation trying to, you know, think, well, this is temporary. I can change you. Or, you know, I don't really like this lifestyle. Once we are committed, I can change this lifestyle that he's in. Mm-hmm. And it sounds like she, instead of trying to change you, she like signs up for the program, for the Ranji program yeah. and all that it came with. Yeah, and there's a lot of nuance that comes along with it that you don't know what to ask until you experience it. Mm. But I have a lot of friends who do comedy, and that girl's like, why you got to go hang out every night? And part of my business is you have to hang out in comedy clubs in order to get more work and create relationships, you know? Um, Because only like 20% of it is actually talent and performing. The other part is hanging out and socializing, which is kind of tough selling. I don't think we knew that. uh, Yeah, it's a tough selling somebody who's uh, uh, emotionally needy. Oh, you're right. If she's if she's got extreme attachment, <laughs> you gotta do it every night. You gotta go hang out with people every yeah. night. I'm like, yeah, that's what I do. And for me, with my younger self, in order for me to take a day off, I'm like, I'm missing out on the opportunity to like be in front of people who can potentially change my life. So people are like, why you gotta work every night? I'm like, well, you're not taking a day off to meet me. That's how I saw it. Mm-hmm. You're not taking a day off work to meet me, but I have to take a day off work to hang out with you. So I'm losing out on opportunity and money by going on a date. But you know, the right person, they'll get all that. Right. And like this speaks to a part of your testimony in what you've experienced and being also able to identify, right? Who's for you and who's not for you. Of course. And so like 
all of this circles back to what today's main topic is, mm-hmm. which is the, you know, the three ways that a man views a woman. Mm-hmm. And um, I just want to review for people who haven't like gone to your IG or heard what you had said, right? I'm gonna I'm gonna let them know why I had to bring Ranji on today's episode. Let's do it. You did this um this uh straight to camera, you know, talk on like the three categories in which a man sees a woman. And you said that a man immediately knows like by the second date where he places a woman um and how he like views her. And Absolutely. so you described it as the fun girl. Mm-hmm. Um and she doesn't like get to meet the family. She um only is You're not holding hands in public. Him. We don't yeah, walk out when the sun is out. <laughs> it's simply transactional. Um, how does a woman know that she's the fun girl? So on your episode, you had identified like how he treats her, right? So talk to me a little bit about how he treats her, but then also how a woman can know that she is this fun girl. Well, for me, when I've had fun girls, we both signed up for the same thing, you know, and that was a tough part because I was, I feel like I was a terrible dater looking back because I feel like I was a husband. Like I, I functioned like a, a husband. husband. Yeah, I, I was a that. husband. I was, I was a, <laughs> it's going to be a part of my set. So oh, okay. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, you basically a spicy uh, tip, but I'm going like, to credit you. <laughs> hilarious. I feel like I always had the heart of a husband because I always wanted church boy. I always mm-hmm. like, knew that to date with the purpose. And in the South, it's different. Like in the South, waiting till marriage or, you know, dating with the purpose is the first girl you see with some hands and lies, you know, that's my wife. But out yeah. here, uh, I came out here. I was celibate for a long time. And I'm like, I can't be celibate for but this ain't it. This is not it. Right. You know what I'm saying? And then well, I was celibate and I meet a girl I like and she'd be like, why are you going home? And I'm like... Because uh, I can't say because Jesus told me to. I'm going to go home. You know what I'm saying? Because I got this monster. I'm trying to manage the monster and, you know, and and be clear with myself. And they were like, what, you gay or something? I'm like, no, I'm not gay. I'm trying to do the right thing because I feel like I don't want to do this unless I know who you are to me. But then I went from that to uh, trying to validate and and feel feel that void of, quote, unquote, what a man is. So yeah. I was I was on it. I was doing my thing. I was I was in these streets doing my thing but I was like no nah, because the, 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 the trouble became where again I function like a husband so I meet a woman I function like a husband in her space we're mm. doing what we do and then she's developing these feelings which right. I'm creating because I'm showing up for her we going out on dates and uh she'd be like where's this going and I'm like well I told you I ain't looking for nothing you know you and just wanted to have fun right and she was like well you led me on and I was like well we both agreed to do what we did and we didn't talk about anything so I thought it was okay you know what I'm saying and then I was like, I am creating this energy to make girls crazy because mm. I'm showing up for them and you can't have dope sex with somebody and be like, that's my buddy. That would drive them crazy. You can't say that's my buddy. But at the same time, we're adults and we both participated in it. We didn't. We never talked about relationship stuff. Mm-hmm. And I thought that if I mention I'm dating other people or if I am healing, then I am okay and she would get it. But no, it would be <laughs> like, she would want me to literally manage her fears. And I'm like, I don't manage... I don't manage fears. Like that's not my job to manage fears because we both made an adult decision. You know what I'm right. saying? Because I, I always consider myself an honest hoe. I'll be the dude, be like, we smashed. The next day I'll be on a date, and she'd be like, "Well, you trying to play me?" And but I was, like, like, I was like, "Well, I'm telling you what I got going on, so you don't have to guess. That way, you know, you have a choice to decide whether you want to be a part of what I'm selling. My job is not to manage your fears, but at least if I tell you the truth, you can decide whether you want to be a victim or a volunteer. And I was always honest about what I was doing, but a lot of times people would build a fantasy about around the moments we had. And I'm like, sex doesn't equal intimacy. Sex doesn't equal a relationship. Ooh, I didn't take again. you out. Yes. Sex doesn't equal intimacy or a relationship. Like I did not take you out. And I not did not say the words we are exclusive. Like we barely talk. And literally you call me after midnight, but then you're saying where is this going? That girl, like she called me literally after midnight, like all the time. And we got down and then she was like, where is this going? I was like, this is all we've ever done for a year and a half. Why are we changing it up? I have no problem with it. Right. But apparently you do. So you have all the power to leave if you don't like what's happening. So I let's circle back. You mentioned something earlier that right now you just said victim or volunteer. You're either a victim or a volunteer. So mm-hmm. it sounds like you are extremely aware of when you were dealing with this like fun girl, right? You put her in this category of like fun girl. Yeah. And you're saying that because you let her know what it was for you, that she's either a victim or volunteer. Either she's signing up for it or... She's going to be like hurt in this process. Right. But you knowing that these women are catching feelings, would you still continue to be involved with them and potentially um, 
not be not take responsibility for the way that they felt were you this accountable in the moment like the way that you're accountable now you know and you have like moved on you're married were you this accountable at the time or were you defect you know deflecting and like gaslighting them when they would say hey but you're acting like a husband you just don't want a commitment well i never lied to them like i never lied about what i was doing and what i was looking for you know what i'm saying i feel like a lot of the issues came and particularly in my situation was when they told the committee when you tell the committee, mm. the committee want answers because you can't Absolutely. be around the committee. And the committee like, so where's this going? What are y'all doing? And this one particular girl I'm thinking about, she was, I, I enjoyed her company, but she, I knew <laughs> she wasn't my person. Like she was not my person. Like, okay. We talked every day. You know, we send each other memes. You know what I'm saying? Uh, we hung out. We kicking it. Like I'm, she's at my house and I'm hungry. So I'm like, hey, you want to grab something to eat? And I, she's at my house and we, I want to go to the movies. And I'm like, hey, you want to come to the movies with me? Um, but I knew she wasn't my person. You know what I'm saying? And how? How did you know that? For like the women who are in that position as Funger right now, how did you, for the men too, how did you know that she wasn't your person? Let us know. So let me tell you what my issue is. I feel like most of my issues have been spiritual. Okay. So when I had, and I make a lot of big decisions by myself. So when I have to make, make a big boy decision or I'm going through something and I share with you and you have nothing to offer but uh, generic advice, mm -hmm. I you keep your head up, look forward, don't look back, <laughs> do, do you, be yourself. You know what I'm saying? Don't do nobody else. Just do you. Trust God. Like, I like, I am going through a crisis right now and I need some type of uh, crisis management. <laughs> no, I just insight. need, I need some conversation. Or some, even yeah. if you haven't been through my situation, having a reference point can help me. And I, I make a lot of like just being in this support. industry and doing it what can, I do. You're looking she for support. She offered now. nothing. She offered nothing. And so when we hung out one time, the committee came and it was like, hey, what's up with you and my friend? What's up with y'all? And I'm mm -hmm. like, my answer was, I gave her a symptom. I was like, oh, we just trying to figure this thing out. But the real reason was, I'm like, well, she dreams too small. Her love is small. Um, she doesn't believe anything. And she smokes every day. Ooh, that part. Why didn't we say that? How come we weren't transparent about that? How come what? We didn't say that. Did you actually say that to them, to the crew, to the committee? No, I don't say that to the committee. Like, that's not <laughs> in business. Why because her you... and I had a cool situation. Okay, so like, she, you she, told never her, okay. she, she, she only complained about it. Okay. She only complained about it. Actually, she never complained about it because she would be like, she never really complained about it. Because the crazy part is, as much as she was about where is this going, uh, I looked on Snapchat like a month after we kind of started getting weird. Mm -hmm. She had a whole boyfriend and didn't tell me. And I was like, oh. <laughs> That's why I was like, it was more of an issue with the comedian. I feel like she chose me, but didn't give me the opportunity to choose her. Mm -hmm. And so whenever she didn't get what she wanted, um, she made a decision but didn't tell me. So if I did the same thing to her, it would be a problem. And I'm sure if she was to watch this and saw that, like I, I legit found like she was dating somebody on Snapchat. And I was like, oh, okay. But you were on me about where's this going, but you had, yeah. but I felt like I was her first choice, but I didn't act right. And so she chose him, but she so didn't tell happens. me. That happens, right? Like she was, she wanted probably like to leave him, but you weren't giving her what she wanted. So she's like, well, I'm gonna hold on to this over here just in case, like just in case she's she comes married to now. She's married now. <laughs> I am happy. I'm happy because I knew, she, I knew she wasn't my person though. And I'm like, I'm comfortable with that. But I think sometimes when you get in these exchanges with people where it's fun, um, sometimes you want people to own your feelings and that's not their responsibility. You should say where's this going or I can't do this before. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Because my my rule of thumb is never give a man more to, never give him never give somebody more than what you can afford to lose. Never give someone more than you can afford to lose. Never give somebody something that you can aff can't afford to lose. Okay, break that down for the people who are like trying okay. to understand this. this so if metaphor. you like this guy and you have feelings for her and you want to have sex with him and you know you don't have a middle, you have love and I don't fool with you like that. Mm -hmm. If you know you're like that, you have to do a temperature check on yourself, yep. even though it feels warm and fuzzy and say, hey, look, and you should tell a man. I mentioned this too in the video. I was like, you should tell a man what you want. Like, hey, yep. look. I got this WAP and I want to give it to you and I really <laughs> enjoy your company. And I think you're dope, but I can't do that because I know how I am. And this is what I need to feel love. If he says anything other than let's figure this thing out, he's not your person. Mm -hmm. And if you say that and you run that red light, eventually that's not a crime anymore. That's a conspiracy. Because you're partaking in the thing that you say you can't do and now you're doing it, but then you still want him to own your feelings about that. That's accountability, which is an ugly word and we don't do that. You'd rather call him toxic than like be like, nah, he's not, he ain't looking for nothing and I know he's not, so let me not entertain him. Yep. 
and like for the for my audience that's looking for like the breakdown of what you're saying, right? Because they can experience this. But what I like to call this is what you're what you're saying is one they need to have a high level of self awareness. Like, who am I? What do I need right now? And how do I need someone to show up for me? Right? What's mm-hmm. what is my past shown me in reaction to getting my needs met versus not getting my needs met? Right. And when, when you're when you talk about checking the temperature, and the second element you're saying is in regards to self regulation. So what that entails is like, even though I'm feeling this emotion and I desire this thing, this is not in alignment with what he is, but it's going to get me to my goal. What he is offering me is not in alignment with what I desire and what I'm seeking. So therefore I need to stop myself from continuing in this maybe unhealthy behavior in this tumultuous relationship or this toxic relationship as like women like to call it, like you said, and remove myself from the situation. But at the point in which they're wrapped up in their feelings, a lot of people lack self-regulation. They can't stop themselves from actually doing what's unhealthy or staying in that habit of like seeing him or, you know, let him dick her down because it feels so good. And she wants more of like what she's now become obsessed or addicted to versus walking away from the situation, right? Like this is essentially Mm -hmm. what you're saying, like makes you the difference between a victim and a volunteer. You have all the power to walk away whenever you don't feel safe or comfortable. You have all the power. And you should never give power to a man who didn't ask for it. And I know I have a lot of homegirls who deal with pain or they deal with heartbreak. And I'm like, why would you give, like, (laughs) I had somebody deal me and ask me for advice. And it was like, so I met this guy four months ago, super nice guy. We were really close. He had a lot of drama and he disappeared and said, I can't do this anymore. And she was like, I stopped by his house to check on him because we usually talk every day. And he, we talked about it and he was supposed to come over and he did not call. And I was like, Mm. so if you have no drama and you have peace, this man is showing up, he opens your heart up and he is told you he doesn't want this. And he has uh, uh, not shown up for you a few times. Why are we pursuing this? Like, why Mm -hmm. are you handing over your peace because you had a moment with somebody? And I'm like, honestly, and I want to be like, until you have your funeral, you're going to keep torturing yourself because this is where we deal with should and is. Should is by this time, we should be. By this time, we should be. We've been talking this long. We should be. Or we've been having sex and we should. Nope. Versus is. Is is, you got to ask him to spend time with you. Right. Is is, he says he's going to call you back and never does that. And now your curiosity is taking you to crazy girl land because your intuition already told you. Like, I feel like women, y'all so in tune with God. Like, we sure your are. intuition tells you this doesn't feel good. But your curiosity makes you go hide in the bushes with pain on your face because you got to <laughs> see you got to see what your spirit has already told you. We want the And that's proof. what makes you crazy. <laughs> Which, again, like much immature me, when I met people and I didn't like their vibe, like you ever see people that you know and you never hung out with them? Yep. And you never asked to hang out with them, but when you finally hang out with them, you realize why you never hung out with them? Yeah, you can feel their energy. That's your energy, and energy never lies. And I'm saying the younger me would go investigate that. Like, yeah, she she kind of a little crazy, but let me go investigate. <laughs> mature me is like, tires. <laughs> I, I don't like your energy, and I'm comfortable with that. Like, I can always, I'm very sensitive too. Pisces, uh, but I can mm. always feel people. I can feel people's unforgiveness, and that makes me feel unsafe. If that makes sense, like yeah, I know I, I'm around people a lot who have a lot of unforgiveness in their heart. They're very mm-hmm. short-tempered. They got walls up. They're very uh, the sense of humor is very sharp. They're very um, they go from zero to a thousand because mm-hmm. they don't do vulnerability. And for me, like you know, me and my wife, we talk about our junk. We talk about our ugly. And yep. I like people who work on personal growth, but when I'm around people who have that. Somebody hurt me a long time ago, and that's my business card. Like, yep. their pain be their business card. Like, hey, I've been hurt before, and I'm going to remind you every day that you're not going to hurt me. And I'm going to rehearse my pain to myself and to you to remind you that you need to know your place and never hurt me. And I'm like, how can I entertain love with you? There's no room for me to be in your space because you keep rehearsing your pain in front of me. Absolutely. And then you don't do forgiveness. So I'm like, in order for my marriage to work, I got to have amnesia. <laughs> Literally, really? you have wife, to be, we have to have selective amnesia <laughs> and forget. Like, and I'm glad I have a the memory of a puppy because I, I just I, I'm so sensitive. I hold on to a lot of stuff, and I never want to be like that. No, I love what you're saying too because people have to acknowledge that if they're not healed, like hurt people actually hurt people, right? So if you're still hurt and you're still working through that hurt, mm-hmm. you're a weapon. Like you are lethal you could potentially destroy the next person that you're in relationship with because you haven't done the previous work to heal from that relationship that hurts you. And you carry it on. It dims your light. It brings the other people around you down. It, that actually is what, where the toxicity comes from. 
And so we also actually attract other hurt people usually if we haven't worked through our pain. So I'm happy to hear that you like ran when you felt that energy. Oh, <laughs> I'm sensitive. I don't like that. I don't like people getting loud with me. I can't. My wife tell you that. That's my biggest thing. I don't like nobody getting loud with me. I had loud parents. And I'm like, me I, can't too. Have, I can't have nobody yelling at me. I was like, when we first got together, I'm like, look, babe, you can't yell at me. That reminds mm-hmm. me of my childhood. And I can't protect you when I got to protect myself from you. So I need you to be kind with me. I don't curse in my comedy. And I don't curse. Is the top of your that's the top. They're both on the top. It's far right. I don't know. Sorry. I don't know where it's handle your business. Yes. This is what happens when we work from home, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Getting some remodeling done. Oh, um, that is- <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, But yeah, I, I told my wife, I said, look, you can't yell at me. And I said, I grew up in a, a household where my parents were loud. They always had a tan and, you know, they got loud and off, surround sound. And yeah. I don't like being yelled at. So. Because I communicate for a living and I don't curse, I want to make sure my home is the safest place on the planet, Beautiful. even when I'm upset. And I'm responsible for that. I got to set, I'm like, she's not responsible for setting the tone for that. Because as men, you have to create the environment you say you want. You know what I'm saying? And I told her, like, look, I'm not going to ever smash on you. Not unless you, like, threaten my life or whatever. But other than that, like, I'll always make sure I talk kind to you, even when I'm upset. That's my mm-hmm. commitment to you. And we both agreed to that. And now it's like, when we have disagreements, it's literally a conversation. Like, it's like, we might get a little intense and have a little tone to it. Right. You know what I'm saying? But we, that's how we talk now. And I had to learn because I didn't want my, I don't have kids yet, but I don't want my kids to experience being scared to share how they feel and thinking we're going to like not love them because right. of the energy. Because I feel like a lot of times me, I feel energy versus your words. Like your, your energy tell me everything I need to know, you know? So that's something that we agreed upon and that's important to me. And communication doesn't have to be confrontation. Sometimes it can just be a conversation. And I think that we have this preconceived notion that if we're coming to the table and we want to address an issue or we have a problem with something that because it's behavioral or we learned in our childhood, how our parents communicated and we picked that up, we come at them from a like, well, I get to raise my tone. I get to like put you down. I get to throw, you know, daggers at you and curse. And that's actually unhealthy communication. So I love that you put like these boundaries in place, knowing that you came from a background where it's like a trigger from it for you. Because I, I too suffer from the same thing. If I had to lay the, the smack down with my husband also. Like this is not how we're going to communicate in our relationship. Because I grew up with that, the loud yelling, cursing, and like, you know, and uh, uh, all, all of the above. And so when it comes to even setting the example, because you have kids, right? I don't, not yet. Oh, you don't have kids yet? Trying for it though. No, I'm trying. Oh, okay, we're trying to. We're trying to. Shooting the club up. <laughs> shooting the club up. And threw the gun and everything. Trying it's to, that, right, time, that time. That time. So we're putting <laughs> perspective. Uh, <laughs> trying to quarantine properly. Right. <laughs> but like we will be setting the example for our future offspring and how we want them to communicate. And children are paying attention to like how you communicate with her. And it's not enough for like it to just happen when they're born and now you start communicating effectively. You guys are practicing now how you want to communicate with each other and what example you want to share. And you like play like you practice. Yeah, you exactly. Like you practice. I watch my parents curse each other out and they slept in the same bed. So me as a kid, I'm like, Oh, you can have a hard conversation and still make it. But I've dated people who didn't have their parents together and they didn't have that thing. And when we argue, they would go for the kill. And I'm like, how can you talk to me like that and expect me to protect you and still love Right, you? right. But in their environment, they had to survive. So they would do whatever they got to do to make sure, you know, they could They're hurt. thrive. So I get yeah. it. So, But for me, that don't work for me. I'm like, nah, we can't do that. And I think people need to have more conversations like that, like, how they want to see communication in the relationship, like what their expectations are, right? Not keeping, not allowing that person to like just continue crossing that boundary. Like you actually saying, hey, this doesn't work for me. This is triggering for me. And, but that requires a certain level of self-awareness. So I think what you're saying is great. I want to, I want to hop on to the next position that yeah. you categorize that a man sees a woman in, which is a seat filler. Yep. So this is uh, you saying until a man is you ready. I like that one. <laughs> It doesn't like matter that. what you do for him. I turned to my husband when I was watching this and I was like, you agree with this one? And he's like, absolutely. freaking lutely I had a lot of seat fillers back in the day. And so I want you to break this one down. What's the, what's the seat filler? How do you know that you're a seat filler? And how does a woman know that she's a seat filler? When you have to ask him where this is going, you're usually a seat filler. Okay. So give me more um, elements. Seat filler is usually the person who <laughs> is there. And it's more of a convenience thing than it is about future or potential mm-hmm. and like i mentioned earlier i was like you don't have it we don't need more than two days to find out where you go in our life and then and i have to bring this up because i know we the last one is wifey yeah usually when you're wifey we don't want to share you with the world 
Mm -hmm. you're the one, when I met my wife, I'm like, I would be sick if she shared this energy or type of love with somebody else. Mm -hmm. I got to make sure this is clear. I haven't had that many times in my life. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. the seat filler was the one who like, she wasn't a bad person. She wasn't necessarily my person. I knew it. Enjoyed her company. Uh, again, I said I was a husband. So I'm showing up doing all the cool date yeah. stuff. And I would even plan dates. I would plan dates, you know, but I knew she, there was a, there was a, but a B-U-T. There was a, she's cool, but, and, it, and a lot of times when you're with somebody and they're not your person, you get real um, petty about the things that bother you. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Because when you love somebody, you overlook all the petty stuff. Right. You're not even worried about how they sleep or if they blinking too loud. Like, you're not worried about that. But the yeah. person that's not your person, you will put them under a microscope and keep finding things and moving the line every time they do something right. And it's not your person. And a lot of times I think most people, both people are aware, but you're usually the one, men are usually the one that's wrong when you actually say it out loud, even though both of y'all kind of know. Right. I make that statement because I have a joke about how most women never marry the man they really want to be with. Mm. And I say that because you never heard a man say she grew on me. I couldn't agree with this more wholeheartedly. <laughs> I've never heard a man say she grew on me, but I know so many women who in front of their husband and in front of his mom be like, when I first met him, he was not my type. He was right. short. He was going bald. Right. You know, but he took care of me and my son. He was a good man and he grew on me. Men never say that. That's why I was like, they usually, <laughs> women usually marry the comfort guy, but it's the same <laughs> way. It's usually the seat filler. It's used, the seat filler. It's y'all, the equivalent of y'all comfort guy. You know what I'm saying? Cool people um, might not necessarily stir your grits, but they still like, and it could be functional, but they don't, they ain't really that person. Cause man, we got this imaginary chick yeah. in our head that we think we can get that's not even real, but we think we can get her. See? And once, once she dies, then you can start doing the real work. But until she die, you're going to live in this fantasy of going to the club and be like, I'm going to meet this girl one day and she doesn't exist and she will ruin your dating life and you will run off Correct. a bunch of great women trying to meet the one that's in your head. So any, let's expand exist. on that a little bit because that sounds like someone who has delusions of grandeur, right? And I'm not going to lie to you. Women have delusions of grandeur too. But I think that we realize that what we have in our mind are these like high expectations we're willing to sacrifice some of them for the person who does love on us and who does provide security because we realize like that this other version or this this idea of what we want may not necessarily be what's best for us and so the, the seat filler position like i do believe exists for women as well oh i got the list i got a list However, for women too to, to your to your point though about like women settling I, I think that there are the women who settle, right? Because I think that a lot of people in, in these relations end up in these relationships that they shouldn't necessarily be with, right? They don't have the chemistry or compatibility. But I also think that for women, it's different. We can we can be with a person who may not physically or may not at the moment, like the chemistry and the sparks weren't there, but the way that he treats us overrides that, right? We can start to like fall deeper in love with you. But for a man, there is no overriding. A man must be attracted to a woman <laughs> in order to fall in love but the more that a man loves a woman, she can begin to fall in love. He becomes more attractive to her. So it's like this complete opposite. But I believe that that's the natural order of it. Because if we were just walking around looking for the next hot thing on the streets, like we, a majority of us women would be single. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. And so I, I, like, I agree with you, though. I also have a theory, too, and I could be dead wrong. Which Let I me hear like, it. Let which me is hear why it. a lot of married women don't have orgasms. What? I, that is not, that statistically is not true. No, no, no. no. no, no, no. Hear me out. I say true. that because they don't marry the guy that, they don't say, I say that because they don't marry the guy that really stir their grits. The guy that stir their grits isn't a functional human being. The guy that really like. Oh, okay. Really I, hear turns them on, I hear your point. I hear your point. The guy that really the turns them on, you ever he's had, not the functioning human being that you want to raise kids with. So Correct. you want to marry the comfort guy who is in your space. Not a bad guy. He ain't your first choice, but you're like, you know what? He, show, he 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 does he does right by me. That's the guy. And I'm and not you saying can all teach women. Tricks. You can teach the guy who treats you right. You can teach him new tricks. But yeah. the, the guy who bangs your back out more than likely. But there's a guy right. from your past that y'all got lingering or who's one phone call away. <laughs> he he don't need no prepping. Like as soon as you get there, you, you ain't, he ain't got to ask you for nothing. But the guy you married to to pay all your bills, he's like, <laughs> not tonight. I'm tired. That other guy, you ain't never been tired for. He would show up three in the morning. Drive across the city with with no gas and got to work at 8 a.m. <laughs> to get that thing done. 
every woman can relate to to having those experiences, right? Like we've all had like our hookup phase, our hope phase, whatever we want to call it, yeah. where we just want to have some good sex. Mm -hmm. However, I'm a huge advocate of making sure that there is sexual compatibility when it comes to you choosing your life partner. So I want to advise you guys now, because <laughs> I know yeah. you're hearing this, you're taking this advice, that, that if he loves you right, you can teach him how to dick you down right. It may take a couple lessons. It may, you like, you can teach him intimacy. You can go to, you know, a sex training workshop, like whatever it is that you need to do, have these conversations. Because I don't want y'all running back to the guy who uh, works at Ralph's Bag and Groceries, but he, he fucked you the right way. Like, <laughs> I'm trying to get people out of those toxic relationships and out of those situationships with the people who they know that if they want to be a wife, like they have to release those people. They have to release those ties. Because we have to start making better decisions for ourselves as women. There's only one seat available. The man, that you really, <laughs> the, the, the man that you really want is only one seat available. If that dude is occupying that seat, there's no room for your guy because he can feel that energy, especially when you're around him. That That's part. the dude be like, oh, yeah, you got, oh, this your, this your lady? Oh, yeah, you got a good one, man. You got a good one. That part. I have a program, right? It's 90 days, five phases that I coach my clients on, right? Self, passion, intimacy, communication, and learning to say yes. Within those 90 days, when you sign up for my program, you don't get to have sex. My clients lose their mind. I'm like, nope, 90 days abstinence. And part of it is because I can't be having you, look, they be losing their minds, especially my fellas. So when, when they come into the program, they are, it's a little struggle for them. But the reason why it's so hard is because, or the reason why I actually implement it is because, I can't have you doing like the walk of shame or the you know, the whole stroll if I'm trying to introduce you or help you to manifest your purpose mate. Your energy is going to be elsewhere. It's going to be thinking about someone else. The, the, the time, the space is going to be occupied and you're going to potentially miss out on the person who you belong with because you're distracted by what's not for you. So, so I have that in place. I was going to add this too, man, because even for myself, like I was celibate for a long time and I stopped being celibate because I was trying to like, I didn't feel like a man, if that made sense at the mm -hmm. time. I understand. So I started, I started wilding out to fill that void and it wasn't enough. And then that's when I realized the whole husband thing. I was like, I got good energy and good light. And most of the broken women that I dated, they love that energy and will make me their husband, but they give me a say in it. And I was like, you know what? <laughs> now it's more about me protecting my light than it is about being quote unquote celibate. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I, no, absolutely. And I had to, I because I feel like black men, we're not taught to be like, sorry, men of color or black, whatever. We're not taught to like, <laughs> respect your body because when you, you it's like my mama said you can only make one spoon you can make one good sandwich one spoon full of peanut butter you know what i'm saying one if you start making more yeah okay. if you start making more sandwiches you're gonna tear the bread up so you gotta <laughs> you gotta know and not spread yourself too thin because at that point you again you created you i created all the crazy women in my life i know i did because of how i function you can't yeah. give a girl good d and show up and have good conversation and function and i'm talking purpose i'm talking like you know, I'm a church guy too, so I'm talking about right. spiritual stuff and I'm listening to them and they like, oh my God, nobody listens to me. Oh my God, he has answers. And I'm like, I'm, I do this with everybody. Like, you're not special. You know what I'm saying? But to them, because they haven't seen it, they're like, you're my person. I'm like, I'm responsible for making them crazy. So that's why I was like, I had to protect my light and I can't have everybody in my space, even though it feels good and it's fun. Yeah. And it sounds like you're taking- Too much collateral damage. Though. Too much collateral damage. I feel like a lot of men don't take accountability for that, right? Right? When you're in, when you know that you have women who are in the seat filler role and they're just the, in the meantime, in between time till I find my wife, um, there's not enough conversations too about like, not just how you view me or what you're looking for, but in addition to that, am I it, right? We don't get to that part about like, cause someone can say, oh, I'm looking for a committed relationship. And I love those conversations when we are transparent about whether we believe in commitment or not. But are you interested in a commitment with me is a whole nother conversation. That was my problem. I would mention, <laughs> I want to get married when I met a girl. And like my big, my big sister was like, don't do that. Just stop, don't stop. stop. Yep. I'm like, I thought you have to say your intentions. Like I did say my intentions. And later on the girl be like, I thought you were looking for a wife. I'm like, I am, but you have to let me choose you. You can't tell me that I'm yours and then get mad because I choose otherwise, yep. especially when I see something I don't like, you know? Um, also, men don't really uh, value, they don't get to that point in their life when two things, until they value peace, until they, and then also when they value their legacy. Mm -hmm. When you're not thinking about your legacy, you wilding out and you spreading your seed all over the place. Absolutely. You know what I'm saying? Also, when you don't value peace, you will run a red light. Like for me, I dated girls. I'm like, why, why am I dating this girl who's thick and cute, but she ain't got no sense of humor? And I'm trying to be the best clean comedian ever. Like, I'm trying to be the best. Like, why am I even dating her? But, yeah, you know, my ego was like, let me conquer this. Let me smash or whatever. But 
I was like, she don't give me peace. And then I started valuing, valuing like, you know what? I need peace. I don't like headaches. I don't like managing fears. I don't want to be responsible for nobody. Let me not do that. Let me find somebody who literally just makes me feel happy. And then that's when I met my wife because my wife, she was the first girl I ever met that I argued with her. We had an argument and I still felt loved. And that mm-hmm. was the first time experiencing like, whoa, you can have a big disagreement and still feel loved. That was my reference point. Because I dated some girls who were nice girls and they would just let me get away with everything. Oh, but Lord. this was different. This was like, we had a hard conversation, but there was no tone to it. She was just a grown woman. Like, look, I love you. Uh, I said what I had to say, but if you got something else to say, like, I, you know, whatever. And then we was in the car. She looked straight and held my arm, did like this. And I had to deal with myself. And God was like, yeah, that's that ego coming up. That's that ego because you want to say something back and you know she right and you want to say something. But I felt love and I was like, I need to lean into this. I love that. Okay, we're going to get into wifey in a second, but really quick, just to like recap what you had just said right now, even about um, seat filler. Can you just explain how a woman knows or what she should even bring up? Let's talk about what she should bring up or how she can identify whether a man cares about legacy and peace or not. Because I thought that was a great point that you just made. What will she experience and not experience when it comes to legacy and peace? Did she ask him, hey, how do how do you feel about legacy and peace? I want you to expand on that. Um, I don't know if there's a direct conversation. Because I would say instead of telling him, you got to disarm him by asking him more questions instead of telling him what he should do. Because the fear is once you start giving ultimatums, you lose your bargaining power. And then he only does it out of he don't want to hurt your feelings. Mm-hmm. And even for myself, the last two girls I committed to, I literally committed because it was an ultimatum attached to it. Like, mm. you know, where is this going? I can't do this unless there's some kind of commitment, like whatever. And I felt bad and I compromised myself trying to make sure they were good, but there was no end to it because I was like, oh, this is just how it is. So, uh, but again, like I said, I have to bring up my wife, but I chose my wife and I was like, yo, I, I'm done. Like, yeah, this, this is cool. Yeah. I I have more fun with you than I do in the street. So I'm (laughs) Yeah. So let's talk about wifey, right? Because this is the, this is, um we mentioned it throughout like fun girl, seat filler. And now wifey is the big one, right? The, the wifey is the gold, the platinum metal, the, the <laughs> legit platinum, the diamond that mm-hmm. um, majority women want, right? They want that. But we have to sometimes, I feel like go through the fun girl phase, been there, the seat filler, been there before mm-hmm. I recognize that in order to be wifey, I need to not just reprogram like, my thought process and how I show up in the relationship, but also my expectations and like how I'm going to operate in, in the relationship that I want. And Mm -hmm. am I willing to release and move on when I don't get it? Right. Mm -hmm. Because a part of what I coach my client or clients around, and you guys are going to see a spicy tip on my gram coming up soon is that you can't control the love that a man wants to give you. You can only accept or reject what he is offering. And a lot Mm -hmm. of times we make the mistake of trying to control it. Like we're, we're trending tricks. We'll stay a seat filler as long as we can. We'll be the fun girl, the life of the party. We'll be throwing shots uh, all around, pouring them in the homie's mouth, thinking that it makes us look like, look how cool she is. Um, don't you want to spend the rest of you know your life with me? And no, that doesn't work. If he doesn't see you as wifey, and to Ranji's point, if he's already categorized you in fun girl or seat filler, and he doesn't see you as wifey, it's very, There's no promotion. very no hard. Promotion plan. <laughs> I was There's say, no it's, promotion plan. Ooh, it's hard to get that. I don't know how you go get that promotion. It's very, very hard to be upgraded to the next level. You can't be. Um, I feel like there are women who have done it, but it's an anomaly, right? A lot of people are like, well, that one person who hooked up on the first date, they got married. And it's like that exception to the rule that doesn't happen that often. And statistically, it doesn't support it as well. This theory that you're saying... Um, And the reason why I leaned into it and wanted to have you on is because it holds very true. And the relationship advice that I give and the coaching that I give, the the things that you're saying are very, very true. And in the work that I do, I want to support people in helping them when they are ready to be a wife, make sure that they achieve that goal, right? So what Ranji has said about wifey is that he finds a woman that he doesn't want to share anyone with. He mentioned this um, earlier about his current wife and how Mm -hmm. she became or sat in that role. Yeah. One, she probably always wasn't right? in her early 20s, similar to me. We weren't always wifey. We grow into wifey. We become we learn through previous experiences how to become wifey. But you, too, are growing along the process and had to go through your fun girls and seat fillers to be able to recognize and feel wifey. Mm-hmm. So give me background more on like 
not just what she did differently, but where you were at in your life when you decided this is the person who's in front of me. Because I feel like you said earlier, it's a man's choice, which I wholeheartedly agree with, right? You chose her. It has to be an autonomous decision. You have to decide like, this is something that is intrinsic that I want. I'm motivated on my own. No one else is going to like, no outside factors. I need to choose her on my own. Mm -hmm. How did you get to this decision? Uh, Can you hear that noise in the background? Yeah, that's me. Is that me or you? That's me. Oh, because I'm like, (laughs) we really are doing home remodeling. So I I thought it was mine. (laughs) A few things. One is wifey usually holds a man accountable. Okay. And you, and there's a certain energy that wifey gives off where you like, no, I can't play the games with her that I did with the other girls. Like, okay, wifey gives off certain energy. Yeah. Like, for example, I've been charming and funny my entire life, which is usually how I get girls. And then when I (laughs) met my wife, my wife was charming and as funny as me at home. Mm. And I was like, none of my tools in my toolbox work. So I had to literally show up naked as my <laughs> naked self. And it did not feel good. Mm. And I was like, it was scary. But I was like, how I am? I was like, I know God is telling me to lean in this because it doesn't feel natural. And it feels vulnerable and scary. But I feel like this is something I need to take part in. Because mm. all my little tap dancing and stuff I did, like, oh, my God, Ryan, you're so silly. When the girl say my name, I know she liked me. She's like, when she say my name, she want to give me something. Like, Ryan, you're so funny, Ryan. you hilarious, Ryan. You play too much, Ryan. And I'm like, I know my name. Why are you saying my name while mm-hmm. we're here? Um, but my wife was different. Like, she was just goofy and funny. And <laughs> most of my single life, I had to cut and paste to get the girl I wanted. I had one girl, great conversation. Mm-hmm. One girl, sex was dope, but it wasn't functional. One girl, we talk about spiritual stuff, but she was too corny or whatever. And I'm like, well, yep. you too religious i can't do that or you know just I, I had to cut and paste but then when i met my wife i was like i'm gonna have to make phone calls and get rid of all these people because i have to because mm. i couldn't process getting it off one person because i've done it like that such a long time but when i met my wife i was like yo you're pretty dope and so a few things one is wifey usually holds you accountable most of the men i know who got married they got married to a woman that held them accountable mm. men are built to be held accountable but for some reason you can't give a man power he didn't ask to have like yep grown men who are ready to get married, they are built for accountability. Like that's just how it is. Like they're they you can tell a man like how solid he is by what he's committed to outside of you. Oh, agreed. If he ain't committed to nothing, he's said no, he ain't got he on a uh a a month to month plan on his cell phone. <laughs> uh, he on a month to month and his uh and his lease, like you know what I'm saying? He ain't got no lease. Like you can tell if he ain't committed to nothing, that's who he is. And I'm not talking about yep. just committed to money, I'm talking about committed to community, committed to going to church, committed to self-growth, committed to like something outside of you you can tell because grown men it's a responsibility that comes along with being a grown man being a grown man is not an age it's not a certain amount of money it's like what are you committed to outside of yourself which is why i hear people talking about kevin samuels and saying a high value man they're high value to who right value has to show something past the individual correct you know what i'm saying there's no legacy attached to it they just make a lot of money and that's what you want and you're chasing something that don't want you and you're gonna let this man who doesn't know you tell you about who you are he's and give about you the value. resume he's 100 percent talking about the resume and that is has nothing to do with the person's character their dedication to you and what you're saying and it's something that i um just held a conversation mm-hmm. on clubhouse about this is that and i couldn't agree more with what you're saying is that you have to pay attention to his behaviors and more than just how he treats you, right? How he shows up for everything in his dedication to his life, to his service, to the community. Like what you just said right now, I don't think people really pay enough attention to these outside things in how he shows up for his family. If he has prior kids, how does he treat those children? Before we decide that we're going to lay with him and give him kids of our own, how does how does he show up? in his life outside of relationship with you, how is he as a man from responsibility to his spirituality, mental health, to his, uh, to everything, physical health, like how is he showing up? And if he's not dedicated to any of those, if he isn't committed to any of those, he's going to have a hard time practicing commitment with you for the first time. Man, your only purpose of dating is to find out if you're the one. That's it. As soon as you find out, <laughs> as soon as you find out you're not the one, leave. Anything past that, that's why I said that's the victim volunteer holding yourself accountable thing. If once you find out he ain't looking for nothing, he ain't trying to get married, he ain't, he healing, what, please listen to what men say. They usually tell you up front. If he like, I can't do this, or I feel mm-hmm. like you're too good for me, he's saying that for a reason. Yeah. He's Pretty saying much. you're you're too good for me for a reason. Don't come off your throne and, and, and take your crown off to like, come hang out with the poor people. Like, just, <laughs> don't do that. Like, stay on your throne and let him come there. And then like, let him prove himself. Because- I, I have this theory. I got a bunch of theories. I feel like I love your theories. I'm here the theories. I feel like boys give you questions and grown men give you answers. Mm, I like this theory. Because I say that because I've had so many homegirls be like, 
am I crazy to think that, you know, he's supposed to call me? Am I crazy? Because he told me he was going to call me. And then he said, and blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. And am I crazy? Yes, you're crazy because you're participating in his crazy. If he's doing something and he don't do it, you're not a victim. You're a volunteer. Yep. Like, you are crazy. Grown men usually answer the questions of your heart that the guy that you beg for doesn't even know how to how to how to do it. You're asking these men to be grown men when they don't have it in them. Right. Grown men show up and answer like it, women the same way. Grown. Let me tell you something. I man. Let it out. Let it out. My let previous, I dated a girl who did not compliment me. It was the weirdest thing. Like, Ooh, I she didn't like, affirm you. I felt like Ooh. she loved me, but I feel like she didn't desire me. That's a weird thing. Mm-hmm. To not have sex though. with somebody because we were celibate and whatever. And to not have that, to go out into this world, get offered threesomes and come home and still feel like there's no energy. Mm. Um, it's a very interesting thing. And, huh. Yeah, I'll leave it at that. But when I, went, I, met, I met my wife, my wife calls me handsome. And it's like, wow, you call me the thing daily without even trying. The thing I long for and I mm-hmm. beg and had conversation. You shouldn't have conversations about attraction. I had conversations with a person that I love <laughs> about attraction. Like, are you attracted to me? Yes or no? <laughs> should feel like, you know, I've never had conversations. Like, either get down or you get that little. You walk in the room, she get that little sip, that little. Oh. I ain't get the sip or nothing. I'm like, I'm pulling up fresh out of the shower. I done did four push-ups. You know what I'm saying? And I, I ain't get the sip. <laughs> I just talking like ain't nothing. I'm like, ooh, like this ain't good. Me and my husband tell each other we are beautiful every single day. You have like, to. Every single day. Even if mm-hmm. I gain five pounds, 10 pounds, because, you know, I'm getting that quarantine weight. He is still like, you are the baddest in the world. And I don't ask him for it. He just volunteers that. And I'm like, you know, you don't got to tell me that, right? But don't stop. And so right. <laughs> right. it's all way of like affirming me and flirting with me. But what I try to explain to a lot of women, right? Because Rihanna even had like a, a post that she had done saying, um, I shouldn't have to affirm or compliment a man. He should just know. And when I saw that, I had a problem with it because what women need to understand is that people come with an ego, a version of how they see themselves. And your partner is actually a reflection of how you see yourself. So if the person who you are with does not see you as smart, does not see you as beautiful, does not see you as wise or healthy or making sound decisions, then they are going against your ego, the vision and version that you have for yourself. And it's not in alignment with how you see yourself. And this is why the affirmation is so important. Your wife came in and said, like, I see you how you see yourself, but even greater. Like, I, I see all of these great things that you come Y'all with. built for it. And yes, exactly. Y'all built for it. And also what you mentioned, too, as simple as letting a man handle his business versus being so controlling mm-hmm. that you don't want to take your hands off of it, you never give him an opportunity to be the man you called him, that you see him to be. When you don't give a man an opportunity to show himself to be true, and you feel that void, you literally become God in your relationship. Yeah. Uh, I've heard women say, well, he didn't want to go to work. And so I, I help him get into school. I help him blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and then now he he went back to who he was. Like, no, he was all that. He was always the guy not providing and protecting. But when you meet a man and he's trying to provide for you and trying to handle his business, you, and you're so used to doing stuff your way, but yeah. you want a man who will provide and protect, but you never give him an opportunity to do it. Yep. Like you miss out on your blessing. You yep. miss out on your blessing of God, the guy actually showing up and being who you are. It's, I know it's a terrible analogy, but I'm doing it anyway. I got a brand new puppy. I never had a puppy before. Oh, congratulations. As an adult. Thank you. I'm a, I'm a dog dad. Love my dog. <laughs> and so my dog lunges at people when she's on the leash. When I take her to the park, she's a fun, friendly dog. But when she's mm-hmm. on the leash, she lunges at people mm-hmm. and barks, but she wants to play, but her bark is so vicious. You know, it just comes across as like she's a dangerous, dangerous dog. <laughs> but she's not. She ain't going to do nothing. So my logic was, hey, let me not take her around dogs so she can get better. And my mm. wife was like, how does she get better if you don't put her around dogs? Right. You got to have her around dogs and socialize her in order for her to get better. And I was like, you know what? You're absolutely right. Now, yep. granted, she still is a dick when I take her outside, but she's getting better. But you have to let people be who they are. And I'll, I'll, I use the phrase, you got to let God do his thing sometimes. Yep. Like, I dated out of my lack before I met my wife because I was always a fixer. Because of my childhood, I became... I became a fixer. And I always wanted mm-hmm. to fix people. Most people I dated, when you fix them, you don't have to deal with yourself. Yep. But then when I met my wife, I had to put my toolbox away. And I realized, like, I'm the one who needs fixing. I mm-hmm. need to fix myself. I need to grow up and do all this. And put it's that like, energy towards you. Man. But yeah. 
we so used to fixing. Sometimes the person you can't fix nobody you're doing life with. Ladies, listen to me. I'm looking at you. You can't fix <laughs> nobody you doing life with. If you like somebody, you got to do all this work just to get him to go to church, just to get him to show up, just to get him to plan the date, just to get him mm-hmm. to go to work, just to get him to get his degree, just to get make him go to therapy. You trying to be God for him, and God is very, very jealous. He's a very jealous guy. When he see you're being God, God going to take his hand off of it, and you're going to have to deal with your receipt of that. So you calling him toxic at that point, that's on you. That's why I be hearing chicks calling uh, dudes F-boys. Like, he an F-boy. Yeah. Let, right. Let me get this right. <laughs> this man has no car. He has no car. He live with his mama. He eat McDonald's every day. <laughs> and he considered the lettuce on the burger as a salad. So that's his form of health. I eat vegetables um, today. <laughs> don't take his kids now, and you get pregnant by him, but you're mad at how he functions. You, so. He's toxic now <laughs> after you're pregnant by him. And you say he don't want to take care of his kids. But you saw all the signs. But our F boy is your version, I feel like, a fun girl, right? Like, I feel like we have our versions as well of the three. You don't get pregnant by him, though. Look, they do. And they shouldn't be. However, they regret it later. And when you mm-hmm. have this, like, you, you call it an F boy. Um, Ranji doesn't curse. We we have permission to curse on the show, but he doesn't curse. So we're gonna respect his boundaries of not cursing. <laughs> <That's so funny. laughs> yeah. No, you can call it whatever. You good. I don't mind. We're gonna respect his boundaries of not cursing. And F boy, okay, which we're all familiar with, is my what I feel like his version of the fun girl is. And even with the F boys, like it's a good time, but we set ourselves up for failure when we get emotionally attached to the F boy thinking we can change him into husband material. We can't even change him into husband material, I feel like. No matter how hard we try, even making him be like a better person or a better man, or at least treat us better, at least be a good F boy, um, they're just lacking. And so the the other one that I feel like is your version of a seat filler for us is the nice guy. The guy who, when the F boy doesn't want to commit to us and we can't get him to uh, treat us the way that we deserve and plan the dates that we want and do the romantic things, we go to the nice guy, the seat filler, who is going to comfort us. He's going to do, he's going to, he's going to help us with our work. He's going to do like sweet little things for us. He's going to tell us how beautiful we are and make us feel good. He wants to even sometimes like introduce us to the family. Sometimes he even wants a relationship Mm -hmm. and we're procrastinating on being in that committed relationship because the person who we really want, kind of like what you said, we choose this other person because who we want isn't available or won't give us what we want. The nice guy gets that. Yep. Now, I'm not an advocate. Are moving on to the ladies list? Because I got the ladies list, too. (laughs) Yes. I got got the ladies list, too. Let me hear hear your ladies list. I want to hear what your version of the ladies list is. It's still a working list, but if I'm wrong on any of them, please feel free to correct me. So, here's my ladies list. This is the the categories that women put me in. Let's go. One is the maintenance man. The maintenance man. Okay. Maintenance man. Guy been around. Okay. Y'all smashed. You don't want your body count to go up, so he's just around. But you know y'all can't function. But- let me get through my list first. All right, cool. He's not a real option, but he's been around for a while. Um, you got the meal plan guy. Ooh. Now, this is interchangeable with comfort guy. But I feel like meal plan guy is the guy, you know you don't like him. He's either short or he's like five foot six or something, or he ain't cute. Mm-hmm. But he always want to take you out to eat. And you like, I ain't doing that. Let me go And eat. your roommates, too. He be taking care of your roommates, too. <laughs> Let me tell you something. <laughs> Let me tell you something. Then you have the friend zone guy who I feel like is your husband, but you don't see him like that. Not sure why, but friend zone is usually the guy that you should marry, but you never see him like that. Yep. Uh, then you have uh, <laughs> Prince Charming, or mm. I call him hubby or bad boy. It's like usually this. the guy that you want to marry. Yep. But he always got something going on that doesn't allow him to date you. And y'all in this thing, he's not a real option, but in your head, you think he is. He either yeah. Like, You're like, I wish he would come around. Yeah, I heard a girl say, I know my husband, but he's married right now. And I'm like, are you serious? That's and she was not like, your Absolutely. husband. I didn't yeah. say it. We get fixated right. on people. <laughs> yeah. And usually, that's why I said, usually it's the, the Prince Charming that you want. That's the guy you feel like you deserve, but you never get him because he always got something going on. And last but not least is the comfort guy. That's the guy you usually marry because uh, he grew on you and he's always been there. Uh, super nice guy. Not your candy. Doesn't stir your grits. Um, but <laughs> he's responsible and you can see yourself doing life with him. So if these are all the categories, what were you for your wife? Um, there's got to be a category of like that well, purpose Well, this mate. is the thing. But there's a difference. And I'm only saying this because I feel like I know a few women that married the man they really wanted to be with. Because based on the numbers and the figures with me and my wife, we're yeah. not supposed to be together. Like nothing about us, we should not be together. But we legit defied all odds to marry each other. And I'm happy with that. So what I feel like you defied all odds. 
Um, so this is a whole other conversation. We can talk about it later. I will make sure <laughs> okay. get my wife approval. Okay. My wife is Muslim and I'm Christian. I oh, talk about got it. it on, okay. I talk about it on stage. Got it. Um, and I had literally abandoned all the thoughts that came along with how I thought my life should be. Yeah. In order to meet my person. So she literally got disowned to marry me. And that wow. I want to honor that because, you know what I'm saying? To have somebody, you know, be like, I'm not, I'm not talking to my parents. Sacrifice. For yeah, me, I'm like, I got to honor that. You know what I'm saying? And so for me, I was worried about what my my spiritual church friends would say. And then um, I was like. On, you guys are on some Prince Harry and Meghan Markle stuff right, right now. Right, <laughs> right. And then so I was like, it doesn't matter if they approve them because I'm like. I, it's my decision, you know, and most of them, you know, the church answer was like, she Muslim, why y'all unequally yoked? I'm like, all the divorced people I know are Christian. I don't know any divorced Muslim people. So why are we tripping? You know what I'm saying? Wow. But, you know, I talked to one of my OGs and he was like, look, man, everybody in the Bible had to leave their family to become whatever, you know yeah. what I'm saying? And you have to get rid of your should and live in your is and y'all create whatever your is is, you know what I'm yeah. saying? So for me, I said, I had to just completely like die to all the things that I thought were normal in life yep. and, and choose love over what I thought my life should be. And it was the best decision I ever made. Now, granted, it was scary for me and my wife because we didn't know. And she was like, look, if I get this on by my family, you need to be here for me. Mm. And no matter what that looked like, because every day going to be different because I'm yep. detoxing from my family. The my spicy so, um, Yeah, I know. But I'm saying like in the beginning when you... When you're oh, no, it's hard. I'm experiencing sure. Experiencing something you've never seen yeah. before or marrying outside your culture or whatever, like it's a scary thing, you know? Right. And I never... I, I don't have a reference point because my parents would never disown me for nothing. But the the energy and the look on her face when she talked about like, man, my my family will kill me. Yeah, I could feel that energy. I could see her shut down and become, I want to say, a little kid around her parents. But the cultural thing is so heavy in her. Yeah, in her in her family. I was like, yo, I can't. I gotta honor that. You know what I'm saying? So we're not supposed to be together. You know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? But legit, that's why I said husband fantasy guy. And yeah, we had both had stuff going on, but it made sense and we chose each other. So literally she got the guy that she wanted. I'm the husband fantasy guy, but, and I felt the same way. Like she was my wifey. Like, you know, what it was. my motto for my company is, um, or like our, um, like our, our saying that we say what? is transform perspectives, fuel connections. Mm -hmm. So if you can transform your perspective on this, like idea or this notion of what you have in your mind about what it's supposed to look like, you get past that, you throw, you dump that out, right? You can actually create the connection you're supposed to be with once you do that massive dump, that massive reprogramming. And it sounds like that's what you guys had to do in order for this relationship to actually like happen and for her to be able to step into actually being like your wife, right? Because you guys are purpose mates. It sounds like you both are in alignment with where each other is going. I didn't even know until I got into it. I mm -hmm. didn't even know. And for the fellas that's watching this, <laughs> fellas, I need you to turn your volume up. Listen to me. Fellas, that, if you're watching this, You'll never get the woman you say you want until you commit to her. Mm. Whatever you got in your head about how you think your wife should be, until you commit to the woman that you say you want, you'll never receive that. Because there's something about how, especially in this town we live in, a lot of I know a lot of homegirls who've never had a man who's there for them no matter what, from childhood to now. They yeah. have degrees and everything. I'm talking about like a man who's like, you can keep arguing, but I ain't going nowhere. So your food is on the stove. And uh, you can come eat whenever you're ready. So you can chill out and let me know when you're mm -hmm. done being mad. Like, they have never experienced that. And being that grown man and you're committing, they know you're not going nowhere, they'll let you choke you a little bit. They'll let you choke me a little bit. <laughs> they'll let you do whatever. Because <laughs> then they know you're not sharing that with other people. And they'll give you all of that because they've been waiting to do that and be comfortable and completely let the guard down and be a little girl in your presence because they know you're not going to share it with the world. Yeah. They don't mind a little chokage, a little uh, tap out. I love you, babe. Tap. Thank you for saying this. I need y'all to listen to what Ronji is saying. Like you showing up in your full superior masculinity lets us sit back in our full femininity and allows you to just lead, allows you to guide us, allows you to direct the entire show. And we will be so much more flexible, so much more in our loving, emotional softness for you. Like, Thank you for sharing that. I feel like that's the, the mic drop right there, fellas. Y'all need to listen to that. And ladies, don't stop until you get that from this. a man. Dang you got to tell them over right and one. over. I'm telling them over and over until they get it. <laughs> if he ain't the right one, you'll never experience that. So listen, until you know he's ready, ask him, hey, you try, you want to get married? I ain't saying to me. Just take take pressure off him. I ain't even saying get married to me. Do you want to get married? Do you want to get married? Like within you the value next, marriage. Whenever time. Yeah. Yeah, do you, is that something you interested in? Not even with me. Like, just have fun when you talk to him. Mm -hmm. Have like, I ain't putting too much on it. You know what I'm saying? Ask him. And that's how it should and be because. Anything other 
early on, we should not right. be trying to make you the husband until we even know whether you're a good friend. So we even know whether we like you. We Oftentimes we're like, what are you looking for? Trying to make him say like, well, I want a wife or I want a girlfriend or I'm looking for a commitment. And then we're over here making him feel as if like, well, if you don't want that with me, I'm out. And it's only date number one. So I feel like find out where he stands with that. I completely agree with you. Find out where he stands with that. And then as you get to know him and you decide you want him for that, then you have the conversation about, do you see that with me? But if y'all don't know each other, you shouldn't be having that conversation yet. Yeah. And you probably want to ask him before you have sex with him. Oh, that'd be a great idea. I need you. No well. pressure. You know, I have fun. Like, just, <laughs> <laughs> just have fun and ask me. Hey, look, random question. I know we enjoying these little hamburgers or whatever, you know, you can afford right now. <laughs> Cute. Thank you. Um, but yeah, you you want to get married one day? Not not to me, just wanted to know. Because if you not, I just I don't want to waste your time. Yep. This is not if he act weird, goal. if he act weird, his patterns change, let him go. Let him be great. You don't have to investigate his silence. Silence is an answer. Him not having an answer is an answer. So please listen to that. And I know no you're mostly connected. Yeah. I had, no uh, communication say, is a form of communication. <clears throat> and when my homegirls say, uh, I usually like I'm loyal when I meet a guy because I don't want to be an emotional whore. Meaning like she don't want to share those experiences with other guys uh -huh. because it's easier than whatever. And I'm like, well, did he say he committed to you? And she's like, no, but that's just how I, cause I don't want to be sharing. I was like, you better keep dating until mm -mm. he says, this is what we're doing. Look, and you should keep dating. Even if until he say it, you should keep dating. Even this is dating coming him. from a man. I need you guys to listen to this. Cause I tell you, you this all the time. Keep dating. <laughs> Stop keep committing dating. to men who aren't committed to you. Listen to what Ranji is saying. You hear it, you're hearing it from a man, ladies. Like, I'm, thank you. Thank you. It's easier to call <laughs> us toxic than be accountable to yourself. It's way easier. That part. So I love everything you just shared today. We're going to wrap up. You are going to close out with giving us the naked truth. Okay. So we're going to get mm. a little bit more sentimental on this last question. If you could travel back in time or to the future, what moment in your life would you travel to and why? Hmm. <laughs> Tell us that time period. Tell us that, that moment. Uh, I've been traveled back. Man, travel back to a time period that I could change. You you necessarily can't change it. You would relive it. So you would travel to the past and relive it or travel to the future and live it. Uh, I'll probably back when I met my wife. Oh, he's just going to show his wife this episode uh, later. He's trying to get some. I would. Uh, I would. Because I'm like, <laughs> it was. Let me tell you something. Half this battle is finding out why you're on this planet. The other half is like finding out who you're supposed to do it with, mm. to live this life with. And so when I met my wife, I probably would have flirted with her a little more because I didn't know. And she was running from me because she wouldn't pay me no attention, mm. trying to find her sister. And I was like, you over here about to block your blessing. And uh, <laughs> she called me a thirst bucket because I wanted to talk to her the same night we met. And she's like, why are you calling me the same night? And I was like, well, I'm practicing good habits now because I want to talk to you every day. Mm -hmm. And if we get married and I don't want to talk to you for a day, we're going to have a problem with it. So now that we're single and I like you, I want to talk to you. And uh, yeah, I'll probably flirt with her and be like, you know, I'm about to change your life, right? I would, I don't know. I'll probably like to say so. <laughs> and then give her like a real uh, serious look like, oh, you know, I'm about to change your life, right? And she would see her all through that and be like, prove it. Prove it. <laughs> prove it. <laughs> <laughs> prove it. Like, all right. Okay. All right. I love this answer. Okay. Ranji, let everybody know where they can find you, where they can find your work. Are you on tour? Is there like a online special that we should be checking out? Let everybody know how we can get more laughs from you. Please do me a favor. Follow me, Comedian Ranji on everything. Comedian R-O-N-G, particularly on Instagram. That's why I post all my information. Comedian R-O-N-G. Uh, every Thursday night, we do a dope game show called Couples Couch. Um, because of my birthday and some travel coming up, I may not do it in the next couple of weeks, but if you follow me, comedian, R-O-N-G on everything, I post all that information. On Thursday, we do couples couch and we also do, also we do a Q and A with Bays. That's me and my wife talking about, uh, all the stuff and all the mistakes we made, uh, from dating till now being married, uh, almost two years. And then every Sunday we do, uh, virtual chocolate Sundays, which is the dopest, longest running comedy show where we have stand up comedians. And we have a full after party, all from the comfort of your house. Super dope show. All you got to donate is at least a dollar uh, mm -hmm. to get in. ChocolateSundays.com. But again, if you go to Comedian Ranji, I'll put all the information on there. And I appreciate you so much. Also, I have a great YouTube page where I post, post a lot of my long form of the conversation with me and my wife. And we'll start going live, too, on YouTube. Mm -hmm. uh, Comedian Ranji on YouTube. Comedian R-O-N-G-G. <laughs> Please don't block your blessing. And uh, yeah, Marty, thank you so much for having me. I, I, I can't wait. 
to finish this conversation. We do it again live. I know. I want to hear some of the, the juicy uh, mm. the, the private stuff you were holding uh, back on. But uh, you guys can always play with my Twitter or stroke my Instagram at Spicy Mati. Go to the <laughs> spicylife.com. Make sure that you click and subscribe to the Spicy Life podcast. Download this episode, share it with a friend. Um, and there you guys have it. You have just been spiced. The Spicy Life.